Welcome everyone um, to our session with Blackboard and Hypothesis, Leveraging Hypothesis Social Annotation in the Age of AI. Um, so today um, we're going to be talking about different ways you can use Hypothesis Social Annotation either in conjunction with AI or maybe to discourage your students from using AI in your courses. So the agenda for today, I want to start out by just first explaining what hypothesis social annotation is. So I recognize that not everybody who's joining us today might be familiar with hypothesis. Um, so I'll just do a quick five minute intro to show you what hypothesis allows you to do in your Blackboard course. Um, and then I will hand it over to um, our guests today, Robin Bell, who will talk about the need for AI literacy and how she is facing AI literacy with hypothesis in her own courses. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some ideas from my end on how you can start using to approach AI with your students. So today it's going to be me and Robin speaking with you. My name is Christy Carolis. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis, and I'm an instructional designer. Um, I've been supporting faculty with using educational technology for about a decade, and I also use Hypothesis in my own courses that I adjunct. Um, Robin Bell is joining us from South Texas College, where she teaches English, so she'll be giving us the rundown on how she She's been approaching um, the use of AI in her courses with Hypothesis. So like I said, I first want to kind of set the foundation, set the stage here for what it looks like to annotate with Hypothesis um, for those of you who might not be familiar with the tool. So I'm going to hop over into my Blackboard course. So I'm in a, my Blackboard um, learn original course, and I have a document loaded into that course. And I'm going to open this document on my screen. And basically what Hypothesis is allowing me to do is open this document from my Blackboard course, and it overlays this sidebar on the right-hand side of my, um, court, my document within the course. So you can see throughout this sidebar that there are some conversations happening. And I want to highlight a couple of things that are going on. So if I'm looking over into the distance over here, it's because this is where I have my course on my monitor. Um, so here you might notice that we have different pieces of highlighted text on the screen. If I hover over um, text in an annotation on the right hand side, you'll see that text changes color on the left hand side. So I can see exactly what portion of text a student has annotated. So Enrique has asked a question about the course learning goals in my syllabus. Um, later on, I have annotated one of the course learning goals itself. And then again, there's an annotation about the online format and the schedule. So each annotation is anchored to a very specific piece of text, whether that is a word, a phrase, a sentence, you can choose exactly what you're gonna comment on with hypothesis. And we're calling it social annotation because the default setting here is that everyone can see everyone else's annotations. So when you see on some of these annotations, the option to show replies. Um, when I click on that option to show replies, it expands almost like a threaded discussion. So here, me and Enrique are having a conversation about a course learning goal. And then further on, Jamie and Enrique are having a separate conversation about a different um, tool that's being used in the course. So we can have almost these simultaneous conversations over a text using Hypothesis um, that I directly opened from my Blackboard course. So Hypothesis allows us to have these simultaneous conversations and have students actively read and comment on the text as they're reading the text. So if I wanted to add a comment here, I could simply select the text that I want to annotate 
click the annotate button and then I can add an annotation here and post that and everyone in the course can see what I have annotated. So that's kind of the basic rundown of what hypothesis social annotation lets us do in Blackboard. A little bit later on in the session, I will talk about some of the details of how that um, integration works with Blackboard. But first, I want to um, talk about um, why you might even want to be considering using hypothesis social annotation um, in your course with these new generative AI tools that have been popping up. So why is there even a need for AI literacy and how do we approach it with our students? And this is where I'm going to turn things over to Robin to tell us a little bit about how she's approaching AI literacy and how she's using hypothesis social annotation in her courses. So Robin, do you wanna talk a little bit about your slide here? Yes, yes, I will. And I actually think it's really important to talk about this because this slide here represents the very first step that I take with students before we even really talk about or do anything meaningful with regard to AI. And so I, I did start last semester um, kind of in an experimental uh, sort of phase where I think that AI was more like the elephant in the room. It was something that we all knew about. Um, many of us were maybe starting to experiment with it and consider how we were going to navigate that, whether we were going to allow it, whether we were going to try to, you know, use it as a tool. And I think, you know, after I, I used it for uh, a, a small amount of time, I, I already saw the, the vision and the possibility and I know that just a moment ago, Christy brought up the fact that, you know, the things that are going to be addressed here are, you know, how and why we might even want to be even talking about AI literacy or how we might want to use it in our courses. But I know that some people may have a completely different philosophy than I do, and that's certainly uh, valid too. But I think the way that I see it, I feel like it's very important for students to, um, for me to build buy-in for students and to make an appeal to them um, that's related to academic integrity, but not, you know, honesty for honesty's sake in the abstract, but more in a practical kind of way where students can see what's in it from that for for from their vantage point in terms of learning how to use AI ethically, responsibly, and effectively to improve their workflows and uh, foster real learning and boost their creativity. And I start out by telling them, and last semester when we started this, I didn't have this slide here, but I do have this slide now. And it's one of the first things that I show students um, to kind of make this appeal. I tell them that if AI can outright do your job or if it can outright do your homework, um, what use will you be to your future em employer? And my philosophy is that I need to get them to buy into the value and the integrity of their degree. And if they're doing things to circumvent real learning, then they're devaluing the worth of their degree. They may very well have that piece of paper at the end of four years, but it won't mean much if they can't do any do what the, the degree claims they can do. And kind of, I think the prevailing uh, internet wisdom is that AI won't take your job. Someone who knows how to use it will. And this has kind of informed my philosophy and my decision to tr try to use and incorporate AI as a tool, not as a focus, not as something to ever do our work for us, but something that we can work into our workflows to improve them and evaluate them and learn how to um, use it better so that we can be more uh, more productive. And one of the things that I like to emphasize with students is this notion of us being the pilot and AI being the co-pilot. 
And that's kind of a riff off of the language that Microsoft uses and GitHub. And, you know, the links on this slide actually go out to those places. And I do talk to students about that. And neither of those platforms are intended to replace the humans that use them, but they were designed, you know, with the, the mindset of making our workflows more productive. But it's important that we are the human in the loop and that we are, and that we remember that it's humans that are behind AI, it's humans that are in front of AI using it. And I think we have a real opportunity as educators to have something to say about, you know, how and, and what happens, not only in our classrooms, but to give students things to think about in terms of how will AI impact their future career, their workflows, um, their own education, and maybe even more importantly, the education of their children. And I will say before I jump in a moment to share with you the uh, some of the assignments that I have created, is that when I beta tested this last semester, I, I did it very slowly and very deliberately, and I created transparent workflows and a culture of kind of trust and co collaboration. And I must say, that it was really inspiring and that the students validated my, uh, for the most part, they validated my positive assumptions about them. And they were absolutely vital in helping me um, kind of transform what we were able to do with three specific assignments last semester and the vision and the execution of what I have in mind for um, this one. So I would like to maybe jump from this to, uh, Christy, can we, uh, is it okay for me to share my screen? Sure. So I'm going to stop screen sharing so Robin can show you all a little bit more about the um, assignment she's used with AI and hypothesis. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is a little Google site that I created to kind of house some of these things, and I think it'll be more convenient for me to show them to you this way. So what I have here is an overview of an AI hypothesis assignment that I hope students find to be wildly fascinating and to serve as something that opens up bigger conversations that have more relevance to their majors, their degree plans, their future careers, and so on. So the name of the assignment is called Art in the Age of AI, Annotating the Intersection of Creativity, Technology, and Its Broader Implications. So in a nutshell, and in a moment, I'll show you what it actually looks like, but it's a very easy assignment. It's high interest, and I chose the subject of art because I think art is, for one thing, it's uniquely human. I think it's something that we associate primarily or maybe exclusively with humans, the, the notion of being cre creative. And if you look up the de definition of art in the dictionary, it will speak to the fact that it is, you know, it is something created by humans. But I do think with the advent of the uh, AI generated art platforms like Midjourney and Dolly and, and others that, you know, we have a new tool um, that can be used by artists and, and people who may don't, maybe don't have a, an art background. And I think art is something that resonates with just about uh, everybody. So what we have over here is I have, um, you know, kind of the PDF document uh, here that I could make full screen, but I think I'm going to leave it uh, this size for now. But I always start when I have a, a, an assignment for students, I give them an assignment overview. And so this gives a summary and an upshot of the assignment, which I'm just gonna tell you about here. So this involves um, two steps, two layers, if you will. And the first step is that students are going to annotate an actual chat GPT thread containing a conversation between me and chat GPT-4 on the subject of art, AI art, all the um, and all the things that that might encompass. So it's a pretty broad uh, conversation that goes in a lot of different directions. And this becomes the, the first text in this little mini uh, AI unit that I have that is currently sitting outside of the other units. So this is something that we kind of have on the back burner 
Um, and this will serve, this is my introduction to the class uh, about AI and why we're using it and establishing a rationale. And I hope that this assignment helps me do that so that moving forward, I can, my lessons regarding uh, AI will be course specific um, to, to my course. So in the first step, they're gonna actually annotate that thread and they're gonna annotate it up to a certain point. And let me just scroll down for a moment. I'm gonna show you the actual GPT thread that I have embedded here. So one of the things that I love about Blackboard Ultra is the ability to embed content. And so you can create uh, pages that are very much like the one that you see here. They're almost like a, a, a mini uh, web page, if you will. You can embed content, you can embed all kinds of things. And I love the fact that I figured out last way, last semester, uh, a way for us to annotate this thread. And now it's even easier because all of the platforms, Bing AI, Bard, um, they all have a way to um, annotate the text that you can generate there natively from you know, clicking a share link right inside. So this is the actual chat GPT thread. And part one, they're gonna annotate this according to the directions that I have for this. And I'll bounce back to that in just a moment, but it's a pretty lengthy little conversation. I hope it, it asks some interesting questions, but the more we iterated, the less formulaic it became, it became and the more like it, the more it became a more organic kind of, of conversation. And the idea is that students are gonna annotate this up to a point. And then there's a part, when I get to part two down here, let me see, I'm looking for a part two. And it should be coming, here we go, part two. So I actually use part, uh, part two, or I use ChatGPT to help me create almost, um, like a custom made hypothesis text. So up to this point, it's the conversation. And then at this point, students are gonna take a pause and I'm gonna give them two weeks to play on some AI art generators that I'm gonna show them how to use. So by this point, I will have already showed them some images in Midjourney, which I use quite a bit. I use it in my courses for almost all of the uh, images that I create and almost all of the images on this Google site are also uh, from Midjourney. But I'm going to show them how to use AI art from some free platforms and give them a couple of weeks to play on that before we really dig in and talk about the ethical concerns, the issues, the controversies, the use cases, and kind of get into all of those kinds of things. So they're going to annotate this, pause, and then I've created some anchor points and I actually gave ChatGPT this instruction. And I said, hey, I want students to have some anchor points below because this is going to be in a hypothesis assignment and they're gonna anchor some of their AI art here. And then they're gonna discuss that experience and they're gonna look at some of the questions that I have that follow and wrap up this ChatGPT thread before we move on to the next part. And so then at the end, I have some kind of culminating questions um, that I want students to look at and explore. They don't have to answer all of them, but they do have to answer some. And then obviously they're gonna have to go in and reply and engage with their, uh, with their classmates. And I do typically, the reason why I have eight anchor points um, up here for the AI art is because for all of the hypothesis assignments that I create, I tend to put students in groups of eight. I have, you know, relatively small classes, uh, 22 to 24. So the groups never exceed eight. And so I wanted eight anchor spots so that students could do this. So my thought here was, is that I can give students some hands-on experience with a real AI tool and do it in a way that they might find to be fun or interesting in some way. And then we're gonna talk about the ethics and the implications of that on a broader scale. So let me go down here to the bottom. So I have some more handouts here, um, one of which is a guide to exploring AI art. So I do need to show them how to, how to do that. So when they do that pause, if they're in a face-to-face -face class, I will have gone over this in class. If they're in an online class, I have instruction in the course, plus I have a handout 
showing them how to get started with the Bing AI image creator, for example, this is free and you get a hundred free credits uh, a month for fast image generation. And then thereafter, if you run out of that, you can still generate images, but it may just slow down a little bit. So it's totally free and it's pretty good. Um, and I think it's fun for the students to play on. Our school also provides us uh, with an LMS version of Padlet, but this could also be accomplished with a free version of Padlet. They have an I can't draw feature, which is powered by AI. And so you can create free art there as much as you want for no outlay at all. And based on the image here, I'm pretty sure this runs on an older version of Dolly. So all they have to do here is create a Padlet, click on the I can't draw, and they put some descriptors of what it is they want to try to draw or paint or create an image of. And it will even create, you know, kind of photographic images of people uh, as well. And then I have an example here. So you can see that here I said, you know, to draw, uh, do Hogwarts painted in the style of Henry Rousseau. And that is a painter that I learned about. And I would say, you know, that's a, you know, a pretty fair representation of, of his style. And so it's just kind of like a little handout showing them how to do it and telling them that, you know, this is supposed to be fun. Don't stress about it. Nobody's going to be, um, you know, upset if you don't create a masterpiece. And in fact, I actually want them to kind of see that. I want them to see that sometimes you can create something that is quite beautiful. Sometimes you can create something that's weird, um, things that, um, you know, are there are anomalies in the images. And I want them to see the good and the bad in terms of the output in the generative AI uh, art images. Now, once they get done with, um, with that, the second part of this, there's another hypothesis assignment that's really the, uh, the second part of this. So the first part, again, is the chat GPT thread up to the part where they pause, play on the art generators. Then they come back and, and kind of culminate that, start thinking about the bigger implications of that. And then what we have here is a two-page article on art and the science of generative AI. And what I really like about this are two things. Number one, it's short. And number two, it contains a claim that kind of inspired this whole assignment. It makes the claim that if we, if we can talk about the impact and the implication and the use cases of AI in one domain, such as art, because art is something that most people can identify with and can relate to in some way. If we can do it in that one domain, it can be a good gateway for you to open those conversations in other dif disciplines or other areas or domains of life. So this is part two, and part two does require some lateral reading. So it requires them to do outside research and they would have to include that in part of their, uh, their annotations. If I bounce back up here to the instructions, you know, in the beginning, I pointed out that, you know, there's an overview here and it also explains the two layers so they can kind of see in an upshot what it is that we're doing. They see the simple little rubric that I have in terms of, you know, how this is going to be graded, parts one and parts two of the chat GPT thread, and then part two, the annotation of the little article, and there's a little summary there. I think, or at least I hope that that is useful. For each part of the assignment, I have very specific instructions and sample posts. So in this one, annotating a chat GPT thread on AI art, it's very step-by-step -step with screenshots showing them, you know, where to post that they need to post to their group. And then I have, these are my, these are my tag types. I do require students to tag um, all of their annotations because I have very specific objectives for each thing that I have them uh, read. They may not change from reading to reading, but if it's something super specific or I have some uh, kind of alternative objective, then that will be reflected in the tag types. And for some things, I give them a range. You know, I might say eight to 10 annotations. Sometimes I give them a hard number and I'll tell them you need at least so many of, 
each kind and so many replies. And then I do try to provide examples for every single, you know, thing that they could come up with um, in terms of the different tag types. And let me see if I can, and here at the bottom. So here's what I want them to do on those anchor points. This is where I would have them share their artwork on those anchor posts and then talk about those culminating questions. And I've also included instruction for them on the other handout that you may remember from just a moment ago on how to play with the AI art generators. One of the things that I'm gonna encourage them to do, but it won't be required, is to create an AI art gallery on Padlet. So no matter where they happen to create that AI art, whether it's you know in the free AI art generators that I recommend to them, or whether they are choosing to try you know other ones, they can house those on that Padlet. And I've encouraged them to you know post a picture like the one that you see here um, to the anchor, but then include a link to your AI art gallery. And so my hope is that that will encourage them to do that, to create more, kind of have some fun doing that and share the results with, uh, with their classmates. And so this is an example of, you know, an image created on, you know, the Padlet AI, you know, art generator. And then I have a link to kind of a little mini gallery that, you know, I just put together and all of those images were created in Padlet, but you could, you know, bring in links from, you know, Midjourney or, you know, any other art platform that students are of a mind to try. And you can do the same thing with Bing AI and they can just kind of collect those, you know, all together. So if I scroll down just a bit more, this will show you what it looks like in uh, Hypothesis. So this is actually what it looks like inside um, one of my Blackboard Ultra classes, but I did drag these to the top of the screen so that we could just see that this is what the links look like and this is what students would see. I do put a description underneath kind of telling them, hey, this is part one, this is part two, and I will often put, um, you know, if it's a two-part assignment, uh, I will generally put, you know, the due dates there just so they can kind of see them out in the open. And just like Christy showed us a moment ago, this is what it looks like in Blackboard Ultra. You can see the actual chat GPT thread there. And this is me um, just as a model for students annotating, you know, out to the side and also trying to model and, and um, show them that they can include multimedia when it's relevant to do so. They can include images when it's relevant to do so. Um, they can include articles. So I even have a link to an article here, which is an, it's kind of an encouragement on the chat GPT thread, but it is a requirement on the, the article. And one of the reasons why I really like this assignment is I do think that it is adaptable to just about any discipline. I do know that English teachers can get away with a lot in terms of borrowing from other disciplines, in terms of things to write about or read about or talk about. But I do think that even other disciplines, even if you didn't use this assignment as is, it's a good gateway. It's a good attention getter. It's a good conversation starter. And e even if you use the little two page article, it's a good gateway into um, opening the door to explore and to discuss AI in meaningful ways as it applies to your discipline and as it applies to the disciplines that the students are choosing to um, choosing to uh, study. So I'm really excited about this. I have just opened this in my classes. This is something that I have not, it's, it's brand new. So this is still in, uh, this is my first iteration of it. So I'm really excited to see what students are going to come up with. And this is my my kind of more structured introduction to what the, than what I did last semester. And I have deliberate lessons that are also presented in class and in the online environment. And then the last thing that I wanna, you know, just kind of briefly share before, you know, turning this back over to Christy is, you know, other use cases. So I do have, you know, uh, kind of just a little blurb here about how valuable, now this I did do quite a bit 
uh, last semester to the extent that I could in the last third of the class, and that's teaching AI literacy as it applies to my course. I created uh, a lot of chat GPT threads that we looked at and um, analyzed and evaluated in class, showing the limitations of AI, showing the capabilities of it, and showing how it really is a skill in terms of learning how to use it and use it effectively. And, um, and I also had and required students to use AI in very specific workflows as part of some of our assignments. And they had to turn in their chat GPT threads to me in the assignment link. They had to post them to a Padlet that I created for that purpose. And we did reflective writing on anything that we did with regard to AI. So we weren't just using it to use it. We were also reflecting on it. Um, and in some cases, we compared um, the outputs that we got there to other human uh, inputs. And it was a really a good uh, experience overall. And, you know, that was kind of my, my first draft iteration of it. So what I'm doing this second semester is kind of a second draft iteration. It's bigger. It's, uh, I think it's better. It's more deliberate from the beginning. And it's probably going to take me another semester or two to get it, you know, to really get it right. But I'm kind of excited about, you know, the possibilities here. So that's kind of an, in a nutshell of what I have to share, you know, with you today. Christy, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and turn that over, turn it back to you. So thanks so much, Robin. Um, and taking that deep dive with us on how you're using uh, Hypothesis and AI in your course. Um, I think it's super interesting, the journey that you're taking with your students and um, the level in which you're having them um, not only use AI, but kind of critically look at what AI is generating and what it means for them. and the future in general. Um, so I did put for anyone that is interested the link to the Google site that Robin was showing us into the chat. So if you want to access her assignment instructions, um, you can see them in the Google site. I am going to spend a little bit of time talking about some other ways you might think about using AI with hypothesis in your Blackboard course or approaching AI with Hypothesis in your Blackboard course. So maybe you're thinking, wow, Robin has done a whole lot in her class with these assignments. Um, so she's really did like, you know, gone into the deep end and really bought in with um, making sure she's approaching AI with her students. I have some ideas for if you want to try and like dip your toes into the water a little bit first, how you might do so with Hypothesis in Blackboard. First, I want to go through a couple of um, key details about how Hypothesis works in school uh, in Blackboard for schools that are Hypothesis subscribers. So if you are a Hypothesis subscriber, um, you do have Hypothesis available in your Blackboard course already, and I'll show you where you can find it in Blackboard. Um, it basically allows you to create um, any document you have loaded into your Blackboard course annotatable. Um, the students and yourself do not have to create logins um, or leave the Blackboard course site. You're annotating the documents within Blackboard itself. So um, your Blackboard course documents are becoming annotatable with Hypothesis without leaving the site or having that extra barrier of creating an account. You also can grade annotations in Blackboard. So I know Robin did kind of briefly show the rubric that she's using with her annotations um, and her assignments. If I hop over back to uh, my annotation assignment I was demonstrating before, you may have noticed the top, there's this grading bar at the top of my document. If you're an instructor in a course and you've enabled grading on your assignment, only you'll see this. Um, and I can select a, a student to grade and it will filter only that student's annotations um, within Blackboard. 
and I can grade that student and that grade will be sent to the Blackboard Grade Center. So it's really easy to give students credit for their annotations and look at just one student annotations at a time. Robin also mentioned this feature as she was discussing the way she sets up her assignments. Um, so in the beginning, I noted that the default setting with Hypothesis and Blackboard is that everyone can see each other's annotations in the class. Um, so everyone's annotating together. But Hypothesis does integrate with group sets in Blackboard. Um, so if you do want students to annotate in smaller groups, say you have a really large class, um, and it just doesn't make sense for 100 students to be annotating together. Or maybe you're in a situation like Robin and you just want to have eight students annotating together. You can set up your group sets in Blackboard and Hypothesis will automatically set up a separate annotation space for each of those groups. Um, so there are uh, lots of flexible ways that you can set up your Hypothesis enabled readings in Blackboard. So. Now that we know a couple of the details of how it's integrated into Blackboard, I want to talk about some of the ways we can approach um, using Hypothesis with AI in mind in our courses. Hypothesis makes our Blackboard readings more active, visible, and social. Um, it makes their readings more active because it's asking students to engage in metacognition as they read. So I think it was really powerful that Robin mentioned, you know, like if you're not putting the um, the work into learning, you're not going to get anything out of it, right? Um, you Putting hypothesis annotations on an assignment is asking a student to reflect on that reading, to think about what do I not understand about this? How is this connected to what I might have learned before? How is this connected to... Um, what we've done in this course or in my other courses or in my own life experiences. So having students annotate is asking them to actively engage in that reading um, instead of just being kind of a passive participant in the course. It makes reading visible for us as instructors because we can see where students are having those connections, where they have questions and um, how exactly they're connecting to the reading. And it makes reading social because, like I said, the default is everyone's annotating together or everyone is annotating in um, smaller groups. So students can learn from one another. Um, and this is in my own experiences, um, whether my students are annotating about AI or not, they tell me that they like using hypothesis because seeing their classmates' interpretations of the text help them better understand and comprehend the concepts that are being displayed in the text. So how do I think social annotation can help um, in the wake of these generative AI tools? Um, and this is for everybody. So whether or not you're using AI or having your students use or examine AI in your course, I think just using Hypothesis along with your readings in your Blackboard course can help. And for, it's for those three reasons I have on this slide. Consistently using Hypothesis social annotation helps emphasize the process of learning over the final product. So why, we have to think about, why are students going to be turning to generative AI tools in the first place? They might be turning to a chat GPT or BARD or one of the tools out there because they're feeling pressure. They have a big paper coming up. They have something that is a large portion of their grade, something that they feel like they can't fail at. Um, and they're feeling the pressure of that grade um, and the need to do well on that assignment. Incorporating hypothesis social annotation throughout the semester as formative assessment emphasizes this process of learning before we get to that final product. Because we have to be honest, learning is not always about being right. We can't always be right about things we don't know yet, right? We might fail and we can practice 
that art of failing when using hypothesis. Students can learn to explore and critically think about the text and do it in a way where it's okay if they're not 100% correct. So we bring in that value of the learning process by consistently using social annotation assignments. And that can help take some of that pressure away from those large summative assessments. It also encourages continued engagement um, with the course materials throughout the semester. So another reason students might turn to generative AI tools when they're reaching their final assignments is because they didn't do the reading. <laughs> so as students progress through the semester, um, life, the demands of life come at them, right? They have jobs, they have four or five other courses that they have to think of, they have family obligations, um, and their exams and their papers and all these things that they have to be held account for are taking precedent. Um, and oftentimes they stop doing the reading, maybe um, unintentionally, just because they run out of time. But asking them to engage with the readings with hypothesis ensures that they're going to keep engaging with the readings through the semester. We actually have a case study on our website with UT Austin um, showing that using hypothesis does increase student engagement with the course readings throughout the semester. That means that by the time they're getting to those summative assessments, they might not need to turn to generative AI because they've been keeping up with the reading. And that's, again, more um, anecdotal feedback from my students is they like being held accountable for doing the reading. Um, they like um, the, the way that it kind of forces them to check in and keep up with that material. And finally, using hypothesis social annotation cultivates the student voice. So having students annotate in kind of a more informal way throughout the semester on your course readings help you as the instructor better understand what that student's writing style sounds like. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of what that student naturally sounds like when they're writing, when they're turning in summative assessments, you can like think about, is this what they've kind of sounded like throughout the semester? So I think consistently using social annotation throughout your readings through the semester just is a good foundational practice to encourage students to that not only value learning, but keep up with the course materials throughout the term. So I know Robin went into like a deep dive of how she is using AI, lots of AI tools, ChatGPT, MidJourney, Dolly, in her course, but whether, what are some other ideas for using hypothesis in Blackboard with generative AI in mind? So if you don't wanna use AI at all, I know there are some people who might be like, AI is not for me. Um, then in that case, you might wanna just use annotation as a formative assessment. So um, like I kind of was just explaining, uh, you can use hypothesis through with each of your readings throughout the semester and give students maybe, you know, low stakes um, formative assessment for that, low stakes points for completing those assignments. So maybe they'll get some participation grades for completing their annotations throughout the semester. Um, and that can also provide scaffolding for those larger assignments. You can pinpoint where students are struggling before they get to those exams and to those essays based on how they're annotating. You could also consider incorporating community annotations into your summative assessments. So can the student annotations actually become course material that could be referenced or cited. Part of my favorite uh, reason for using hypothesis is that it decenters me as the authority with my students and my students become active scholars and active contributors to the course. 
So I actually like to bring um, those contributions into summative assessments and have students cite each other's work, um, cite each other's annotations when they're creating projects or writing papers, because that is something that generative AI does not have access to, right? ChatGPT doesn't know what students are annotating in your courses. So if you can bring those things in, um, that can be a way to make sure that students are incorporating your original course materials into their work. And then similarly to what Robin has walked us through, you can have students critique AI-generated text using social annotation. So your students themselves don't necessarily need to use ChatGPT or BARD or something to do an activity like this. You could simply put an essay prompt into ChatGPT and see what it comes out with and have your students critique that essay um, through a number of different ways. Um, and we have a number of starter assignments available on this slide, and you can take these instructions and use them in your own courses. So you can have students work as editors, for example, and critique ChatGPT's writing style and writing form. Did ChatGPT make a good argument? Did it provide good evidence for its argument? Um, was it missing things stylistically? What was its voice like? Um, you could even have students compare ChatGPT um, written text to human written text using social annotation and look at what are the strengths and limitations of each. I think it's also important to have students fact check ChatGPT or other generative AI. So if it has um, created a text that you can have students annotate, uh, have students really rip that uh, text apart that ChatGPT or BARD or whatever has created and fact check every single fact that is in there. So we know generative AI sometimes tends to hallucinate. I don't know if students always realize the extent to which it can hallucinate. So having students fact check, find citations for each of the facts in an article can be revealing for them on how they can or cannot depend on AI. Uh, you can also have students act as content experts. So I saw this a little bit with um, Robin's example with artwork. She had um, one of the art example she gave, it was like having AI create art in the style of a specific artist. Um, I forget which artist it was exactly, but you could have students do this with writing. So have a chat GPT um, write a poem in a style of a specific poet and then have the students critique, did chat GPT do this well? Um, what is wrong about the style here? What is correct about the style here? So there are a lot of different ways that you can have students use annotation to critique um, generative AI's work. Um, in addition, we have just general annotation starter assignments here. So these starter assignments are specific to AI. If you're not interested in using AI in your course and you just want to have students annotate documents, we have samples of um, instructions for students annotating documents here as well, um, because I do think it is important to prompt your students, um, give them guidance for annotation. If they don't have that guidance, sometimes they're not sure how to contribute meaningfully to that conversation. So I want to use the last few minutes to show you how easy it is to get a hypothesis uh, reading set up in Blackboard. At this point in time, hypothesis readings work best with um, open educational resources. So you can use PDFs with hypothesis, open textbooks and open educational resources like Pressbooks, OpenStax, LibreText are very common. You can use public facing web pages and online articles with Hypothesis. Um, we recently introduced the ability to annotate YouTube video transcripts as you watch a YouTube video with Hypothesis. 
Um, and you can also um, now at certain schools use hypothesis with JSTOR articles and vital source e-texts. An uh, another thing that Robin kind of hinted at is that you're not limited to just annotating with text as well. You can put lots of different things within an annotation um, that can make reading a more multimodal experience. So you can add images to annotations. So that's where students in Robin's assignment are annotating the text and then adding their own mid-journey images to their annotations. You can embed videos into annotations. Um, you can use LaTeX to add equations to annotations, as well as using ex adding external links and tags as well. So again, you can really make the reading a more multimodal experience by adding these different things, which can enhance student understanding of concepts um, by not just understanding them through text alone. So if I have a hypothesis available at my institution, um, in Blackboard Learn, I will find it in my content area. Um, and it would be under my build content space. So you will find it and by scrolling down and finding hypothesis toward the end of the list of the build content space. And I'll click on hypothesis here. I can enter the name of my hypothesis assignment. And I always want to put instructions for my students. So I am going to just kind of copy and paste some of our sample instructions here into my assignment. If I want to use a PDF, I'm actually going to ignore this attachments area here. Uh, this is not where I want to attach my document. I first want to set up my instructions, and then I will add my document as a second step. If I want to enable grading, I can do so here and add a due date and submit. And I've created kind of a shell for my assignment at this point. Now, if I scroll down, I can find the shell that I've created and click into that to see the different options I have for um, adding a resource to a hypothesis enabled reading. So I have, like I said, the option to add a URL using a, from a website, a YouTube video, or a JSTOR article. I can also grab a PDF from um, Google Drive, OneDrive, or a Blackboard. Um, in this example, I'm just going to grab a URL and throw that in here. And my hypothesis assignment is basically ready to go. So in Blackboard Learn Original, that is the, the setup process if you have hypothesis available at your institution. If you're using Blackboard Learn Ultra, the process is not any more complex than that. It's just a different cliff path that you that you would be using. Um, and we do have uh, some instructions in the slide deck as well. So as we come to the end here, I want to review what comes with um, being a hypothesis partner. You do get pedagogical support from our customer success team. So the customer success team provides training for your school, one-on-one -on -one consultations for your faculty. Um, you also have access to some of our resources, um, like our Hypothesis Educator Forum and our support team. Partnering with Hypothesis also gives you access to Hypothesis Academy. And Robin did take Hypothesis Academy over the summer um, and became a Hypothesis Certified Educator. Um, they're two-week courses designed to help you create your own annotation assignment. Um, in a way that best supports your students' learning. So we have two topics that run um, throughout each semester, Social Annotation 101 and Social Annotation in the Age of AI, which works well for our current topic today. And you also will have access to our weekly partner workshops. 
So those of you who are not currently Hypothesis subscribers, if you are interested in learning more about gaining access to Hypothesis um, in Blackboard at your institution, we have a spring starter promotion going on right now. And you can reach out to the email on that slide to learn more about um, how that could work for your school and have someone reach out to you. Current customers, if you need any assistance, please reach out to the customer success team so we can help you get started with Hypothesis. Um, but we are rounding out in the last few minutes today, and I want to thank everyone again for joining and see if anyone has any um, final questions for the day. Um, I see Lee has your hand raised. Did you have a question, Lee? You should be able to talk if you have a question now. Anyone else, you can also either raise your hand or put a question into the Q&A box. I'll share the link to the slide deck in the chat one more time um, and to make sure everyone has access to that. All right. Well, it looks like everyone might be okay for the day. So thanks again for joining. Um, thank you to Robin for sharing her assignment and her approach for using AI with Hypothesis in her Blackboard courses. I really appreciate the time that you've all taken to attend at this busy time of year. Um, I hope you all have a great start to the term um, and please reach out if there's anything we can do to help. Thanks so much, everyone.